I don't think I need an intro. Uh, I've been around here for a long time, so if you haven't talked to me, that's your mistake. My favorite color is blue, and uh, I farm on the weekends. So um, what I'm going to do today is going to give you an update of a project that's near and dear to my heart, because I've been involved with it since 1992. Um, and that's the long-term ecological project along the West Antarctic Peninsula. And in case I run out of time, those are my conclusions right up front. Um, we've got the West Antarctic Peninsula, the WAP, being impacted by climate you know, cycles, and I'll talk about that. It's these climate cycles are driving changes in sea ice, and that's rippling through the food web. And while it's a relatively linear food web, the higher trophic levels really have a lot of life history processes that impact sort of what the response is. And so that's what we're trying to untangle. Uh, and all big programs have lots of players. Um, and so I want to thank the PIs I'm currently with, the PIs that started it and have cycled through, the Are You Cool group, and then the grad students and postdocs who helped. And uh, I'll give a special shout out to Nicole Waite because either I'm in the field or she's in the field. And uh, I think I've probably taken years off her life out of, with frustration. So I apologize for that. But what's this program? Um, when the program was formed, it had nothing to do with climate change. It just happened to get placed by luck of the draw in a place that was experiencing dramatic change. And so we work here along the West Antarctic Peninsula, and it's one region of the Antarctic continent that's seeing dramatic warming. And so the map here shows um, sea ice retreat or ice retreat and ice melt, and you'll see that some areas like the Ross Sea are still growing ice. That's predicted to change in the next you know, 50 to 100 years. And that's when we'll see the entire continent switch to melting. We live in uh, this area, I'm going to show you the data, shows dramatic change. But we're still within the bounds of natural variability um, that you get out of the large global simulations. Um, so we can actually say today that it's climate change that's driving our changes. Um, but the prediction is, is in a year, to, you know, a decade. So when I'm getting close to retirement, we should cross that line. Um, the red there is really emphasizing glaciers. And so there's two big ice changes we're seeing. We're seeing glacial change. I'll talk about that a little bit. But then we're seeing sea ice change, which is really what's uh, impacting the biology. And so if you're trying to sell this to other people, it's the glacial change that rises a sea level actually in the northern hemisphere based on the geodetic stuff. And uh, the sea ice changes are rippling through the food web. This is our study grid um, that we run every single year. Um, and there's two parts to this program. We sample time at Palmer Station, which is right here on Anvers Island. There's a little cutaway that shows our sampling zone. There, there's a few sampling strategies where we have people go out in zodiacs for six to seven months every single year. So our team uh, right now led by Maria Zahn is starting sampling this week and they will continue to do that through April. Um, and there's a boating limit so you're limited how far you can sample. The gray lines are gliders, that's something we integrated in 2008. And then you see little ticks for moorings that are deployed when we have money. Um, so this samples six months, year after year after year, and then every January we run a cruise. And we have fixed stations we sample all the time, moorings, gliders. And the thing about this area is we treat the peninsula as a climate gradient. So up in the north, there has been dramatic melt and transition of the ecosystems. There's actually soil forming. Grass is moving onto the continent, and by the time I retire, they'll be rooted plants unless there's a climate shift in the other direction. And so this upper area is a really, we consider it a warmer, wet, subpolar system. The change we would hope to catch has already happened. And you see it in the biology. The southern part is still a polar system. You know, so if you're up north here, it's definitely warmer than down here. But it's still a cool, drier polar system that grows a lot of sea ice 
in the winter time, which is how we sort of define winter there. Cold is cold. Um, and the idea is that the border, which is this red box, is going to move south over time. So when you're sampling this transect, you're essentially sampling from the future polar condition to the historical polar condition. So it's a transect back in time. That's how we like to think of it. So we've been doing that for decades. And again, the place, the project was started before we realized there was climate change. So this area is warming. This is winter air temperature, winter average temperature from the 1950s to the present. And the first thing you can see is there's a great deal of warming. It's about six degrees. You know, and that's a big deal because this system is regulated by sea ice. And sea ice is a singularity. And once you cross a certain point, you don't make sea ice anymore. So it uh, has a dramatic thing. The other thing to re look at is these large oscillations early in the record and how they've damped out. And that's consistent with this becoming a more maritime climate. You know, essentially we're impacted less and less by the continental temperature variations. It's more the marine variations that dominate the signal now. This warming uh, is expressed in the glaciers. You got about 85% of the glaciers in full retreat. And you're looking at three pictures at Palmer Station. So in the circle is where Palmer Station is from the 50s, the early 2000s, 2013. Behind it's the Mar Glacier. And you can just look at the degree to which the Mar Glacier has retreated over the 30 years. So in my professional career, that glacier has retreated over a football field. So the science part of me is stoked because awesome, I can actually see big changes in my lifetime. Um, the human part of me is like, that sucks. That's a big change. It's changed so much that we're discovering new islands at Palmer Station. So my TA, Chuck Ansler, actually has an island named after him because they used to be covered with the glacier and now they're in open water. Um, and then the sea ice declines. You see that over in the other bottom panel there. Those three lines represent three different areas on the peninsula. The blue, far south, red, more to the north of Palmer. There's good coherence. Big ice ears are big ice ears everywhere. Um, but what we see is there's much less ice up in the north. And so on average, we're seeing about nine, 70 to 90 days less of sea ice per year than we were 30 years ago. And that's a structure um, that's fundamental to this ecosystem. So we're seeing dramatic change. And what's driving that change? It's an interplay between the ocean and the atmosphere. So sort of the dominant atmospheric mode that affects um, temperatures here is the Amundsen Sea Low. And that's modulated by essentially climate sort of variables such as the southern annular mode, El Nino, La Nina, and they tend to interact. So um, when you're in a positive southern annular mode and a La Nina, you essentially push a lot of that southern Pacific water up against the peninsula it's warmer and it keeps the colder air from the continent in. And as we moved over the last few decades, we've been sort of locked in a positive SAM La Nina mode. You could flip back, get some ice recovery, and I'm going to give you an example of what that's what's happened over the last eight years that has ended, but essentially grew ice back. And we'll use that to assess is the ecosystem resilient. The other driver is the Antarctic circumpolar current. Um, largest current on the planet and essentially the areas of Antarctica that are melting is where that circumpolar current is closest to the continent. So, you know, you see tons of ice melt by the Amundsen Sea, the peninsula, and you're starting to see melt near the Totten ice shelf on East Antarctica and they're starting to find essentially the circulation of the circumpolar water across that shelf. Um, and so the idea is, is you have this warm circumpolar deep water layer that essentially impinges on the continental shelf and it delivers heat to the system. And if you look at the atmospheric rise of temperature, the only heat source capable of that degree of warming comes from the deep sea. So it's the deep ocean that's modulated by these atmospheric processes and the overall circulation that is now feeding into the atmosphere and raising atmospheric temperatures. And both of those um, 
essentially are driving the ice decline. And you may have read in the Amundsen Sea that there's this runaway ice sheet collapse that's going to happen. And the ice sheet collapse there, you know, represents a significant amount of sea level rise in our area. And the reason is, is you've got warm water from the circumpolar current that's deep at 300 meters, essentially going across the shelf and under the ice sheets. And you're melting stuff from below with those heats. Um, so atmosphere, ocean modulation, and how's the heat delivered? So this was worked by Nicole Crudo before she went off to greener pastures. Um, and the problem is, is the circumpolar current runs along the continental shelf. The continental shelf outer bathymetry is ragged and essentially slices or fractions of that circumpolar current get caught up and spin onto the shelf as it interacts with that irregular slope geometry. So they get released as eddies. And these eddies are about 30 kilometers wide. They have a lifetime of about eight days and represent a fundamental impossible thing to sample using traditional technology. And so we were using moorings for years, trying to do the best we could, um, but the gliders are really finally giving us the spatial signature of these things. And so um, the way you can identify circumpolar water, if that water is 1.8 degrees or above, its ultimate source had to be circumpolar deep water. So you look for little blips of hot water at a few hundred meters. We have a good idea of where they are and what you see in the other panel there is essentially where we've used a glider and we've tracked it over time underwater at about two, three hundred meters and looked at the degree to which it dissipates heat. And um, if you think about it, that's an amazing advance. You know, you're essentially surfing two, three hundred meters under the water blind. Um, and we've been able to track them enough so that we've essentially figured out sort of the geometry of where these eddies come ashore. And so here's some more of Nicole's data. And she's essentially tracking the transit of these eddies as they head to the coastline. And as they're doing that, they're becoming more amorphous. They're diffusing heat to the surrounding water. Um, and they're located in specific locations. So the size of the circle here indicates the size of the eddy. The color indicates the uh, heat content and they essentially lose heat as they flow in, but they're associated with these subsea canyons. These are glacially sculpted from before, and essentially they tend to funnel these eddies into the coastline. The interesting thing is that these canyons are associated with the major penguin rookeries along the peninsula. So penguin rookeries are not equally distributed. They tend to be focused in very specific locations all of them associated with a deep sea canyon. So here's the one at Palmer and there's what we call the Palmer Deep Canyon. The thinking from the penguin biologists um, to explain this was really based on the past conditions. So in the past, you essentially had complete ice cover in the winter. Penguins still needed access to the water. And these locations essentially were funneling hot water to set up potentially pollinias in the winter that were predictable. So it's the seafloor topography that guides these eddies in, delivering heat to the near shore and presumably giving pollinias back when it was a really cold, frozen place as opposed to a slushy thing right now. Um, and the problem was they had no way to actually document that in the early days. <coughs> so one thing Nicole did is she decided to essentially test this idea using a ROMS model. She worked a lot with uh, Jessica Graham and uh, Dinneman down at ODU, um, who are incredibly kind people. So um, if you want to do Southern Ocean modeling, call them. They're amazing. But essentially, they you know, have a very nice 3D model with lots of the dynamics involved. And you can see these models with hypothetical particles. So you can look at the transport of water from the offshore to the inshore. But you can also look at the residence time of warm water inshore. And that's essentially what she did for one of the chapters of her thesis. So she aligned along the shelf edge all these locations where uh, imaginary particles would be essentially carried. And then she wanted to assess here at Anvers Island how many of the particles reached 
Palmer Deep. And then she also, the orange ones are where she started with a Palmer Deep full of particles and looked to see what was her lifetime remaining there. Um, and so she did lots of model simulations. And what did she see? Well, yeah, so the blue represents sort of where the particles essentially, um, you know, got to Palmer Deep from where it was located, and the red represents where it was so circumpolar deep water. So one not surprising thing is if you're close to Palmer Deep, you have a higher probability of getting warm water there. Um, but what was surprising was the amount of particles actually re reaching Palmer Deep, which sort of agreed with our idea about these glacially sculpted canyons really being these funnels of the deep water into the system. Okay, so that was satisfying. Do we have any observational data to prove it? Well, here's your circumpolar deep water. There's hypothesized transits of hot water into it. Here's glider data um, right at Palmer. Here's your warm water down below. Here you're seeing upwelling right by the penguin colony. So we have observational data to support it. If you go down to near where Rothra, the British station is, you look at their colony. Um, the island is really big. Penguin colony is only on this side, and that's where you see these intrusions of warm water. You don't see any penguin colonies on this side where there's no circumpolar upwelled warm water. We've been trying to go down to Charcot. Um, that's hit or miss. Um, if it's really bad, you get frozen in the ice, and uh, you know, that's always exciting. A few years ago, we got frozen in the ice for seven days. That actually wasn't the frightening part. Paul Falkowski was on the boat with me. Um, he didn't bother me too much, but the grad students were exhausted um, by the time we got out. Um, but even down at Charcot Island, where we hypothesized there might be a penguin colony, um, we couldn't put a glider in because of the ice, but you can see the blip of the circumpolar signature coming in. So the major colonies seem really to be associated with the presence of the warm water consistent with the idea of a plenty driving it. All right, so you have this uh, transport into the system. What is the paradigm for the Antarctic system? Um, you have high ice years, you have low ice years. High ice years tend to have large phytoplankton blooms dominated by big cells. Um, and that presumably gives lots of food to the krill, the krill party, um, and essentially feed the rest of the food web since they're considered a keystone species. The thinking is in the high ice year, in the winter, you essentially put a cap over the ocean. And as winter winds increase, and this is a very windy location, um, the average temperature of a cruise last year was about 25 miles per hour, that was the average. Um, the best gust we had was about 130 miles per hour, and the weather gets worse in winter. And so, if you protect the ocean from that deep wind mixing, um, you won't essentially erode the mixed layer depth deeper. You'll, you won't have it as deep as when the ocean's exposed to that winter blowing all winter long. The other thing is when spring comes, you melt a huge slug of ice under the surface ocean. And so you have another mechanism to essentially stable that mixed layer depth and set up the big bloom. Um, and so this is the paradigm that we've been looking and then this is all being modified by the presence of this warm circumpolar deep water. So is there any correlation between sort of seasonal mixed layer depth and sea ice stays? The black here is uh, sea ice stays, the red is mixed layer depth and you find a pretty nice inverse relationship. So when you've got a large number of sea ice days, your mixed layer depth is shallow and vice versa. Okay, there are differences if you look at the dynamics on the slope, the coast, and the shelf. And the reason the coast is more muddy, intellectually, is um, you have a lot of brash ice. So you have a lot of ice when the ice sheet collapses or not, the sea ice collapses and it gets blown around for months and it tends to get piled up in the coast and that ends up modulating essentially the concentration. Um, but we find a very nice relationship between the mixed layer depth and the uh, sea ice days. And if you look at the surface 100 meters of that surface ocean in summer, the years you have 
a shallow mix layer depth, your surface layer is fresher than when that mix layer depth is deep. Whoop. Excuse me. I'm having too much fun with my stick. Um, so we actually do find a good signature between sea ice essentially helping stabilize that water column. So if we look at the time series, have we seen major changes in the mixed layer depth? So I've carved essentially our spatial grid we do with the ship every January and looked at the time series of sort of the mixed layer depth, seasonal mixed layer depth in the north versus south. In the north, except for exceptional years destroying our correlation, there's a minor correlation, but really not significant. Why? We think that the system was already in transition as we started to sample. However, if you go down to the north where it was a polar system, definitely when we started and we think it's starting to transition, the mixed layer depth has decreased from about 55, 60 meters to around 20 meters. So that mixed layer depth is shallowed by close to a factor of three over time. Um, and the other thing to point out, the Antarctic Ocean, even when you have 24 hours of sunlight, is a dark ocean. You don't get direct irradiance like you would at the tropics. It's cloudy. Um, and so, you know, anything that is going to deepen that mixed layer depth should have a big impact on the plants. So, have we seen changes in the plants? This was a paper by a postdoc, Martin Montez, and he compared early ocean color satellites from the 70s and 80s to essentially the CWIF system in the early 2000s and essentially just looked at the mean. So up north it was the mean CZCS minus CWIFs, south same thing. If it's blue, the total amount of plant material declined. If it's red, it increased. So um, does this make sense? Well, the red, this area used to be covered with sea ice. So it was a very, very dark ocean and as you peel back the ice, you get more sunlight in the ocean, the phytoplankton are happy, and they grow. Awesome. Up here, we've seen major declines. I just want to point out Palmer Station is actually sort of in the border, so it's not in this major decline zone. But essentially, the declines up here could be as high in certain times as 70% of the mean. What's driving the declines to the north? Um, the Antarctic, in general, in this time frame has become windier. Mixed layer depths have shallowed, and as it's warmed, the atmosphere has become moist, and we have more clouds. And so the ocean has gotten darker for those two mechanisms. And that's our sort of running hypothesis. If you integrate over the whole grid we sample, the chlorophyll's decreased about 15% on average. And again, that's a pretty large decline when you're thinking about the base of the food web. So it has pretty large implications. These little histograms is a different mode of looking at the ocean color satellites. And there are indications that not only has chlorophyll declined in here, but the particles in the water are smaller. So you're not only shifting how much is there, but the type of stuff that's there just based on the ocean color. Um, and this change in mixed layer depth is, you know, if we look at the time series this is from Mike Brown's data. He happened to come into my office at about 2.10 today and showed me this figure. And so I inserted it because it's awesome. Um, here's the long-term trended change in mixed layer depths over the WAP. So I've combined the north and south. Here's your trended change in chlorophyll. So most of the WAP we're sampling on the ship is south of Palmer Station. So this is a region that was still at the border between that subpolar and polar region. So we're south of the blue. And as we've been melting the ice, mixed layer depths have been getting shallower. It's not significant, you know, if you're absolutely dogmatic about the 0 0.05, but the chlorophyll is increasing. And that has a biogeochemical impact. This is the delta PCO2 showing essentially the ocean breathing in extra carbon dioxide as you shift the amount of chlorophyll in the water with the lower mixed layer depths. So now we're going to do a resiliency experiment. So we've been seeing these long-term declines and then we had this increase in sea ice over the last decade. I jo joined the program here 
So I like to take credit that I was saving the system. Um, but it's since returned back to its normal decline mode. And so we're about here this year right now. Um, it was actually driven because there was a specific phasing of the El Nino and Southern Annular Mode interactions that essentially allowed them to cancel each other out. Um, and that's why we got this increase in sea ice. But if the polar system is being driven by sea ice and we brought sea ice back, would we see a response in the ecosystem of recovery? And so let's see if we see it. So here we're looking at a phytoplankton productivity per unit chlorophyll. So you think of this as a photosynthetic efficiency. It's essentially a measure of the physiology of the cells. And you're looking at time series over the full grid, the north and the south. And what do you see? You start bringing the ice back and that efficiency of photosynthesis immediately starts increasing. So cells are happier. Do we see an increase in biomass? Well, we're really lucky because this area of the peninsula has about 24 research stations from different countries pretty close by to each other. We collaborate a lot with the British down at Rothbard Station and up at Jubini Station with the Argentinians and Germans. And we've got the time series plotted as anomaly here. And so here's where the ice starts coming back. And you can essentially see both in the north um, at Jubini as well as at Palmer Station, the chlorophyll biomass increased. Um, down south, where you're still truly in a polar system, it's a much more muted response. You know? And so we actually do see the chlorophyll increased as we had the ice come back. Um, when, ice come, when the chlorophyll increases, do we see a shift in the signature of the population? And so one of the things we've been measuring is using phytoplankton pigments to essentially give us a fingerprint of the phytoplankton taxa present using HPLC. And you're looking here at Palmer Station, you're looking at the chlorophyll anomalies. So if you're above zero, it's a big year. If you're below at a low year. And in a big chlorophyll year, it's dominated more by diatoms than the other species, more so than normal. And the other thing is the size distribution um, based on optics indicates they are large diatoms. So in a big year, the diatoms are stoked. Um, in a low chlorophyll year, you still have diatoms. They're the dominant algae we see. This particular location, we don't really have phaeocystis. The big player are these cryptophyte flagellates. These are small organic wall critters, usually less than 10 microns in size. And essentially, the decrease in diatoms is picked up by essentially the flagellates and the cryptophytes. So again, that would shift the size distribution to smaller, which is consistent with the satellite observations from before. Well, does this have any impacts? You know, um, and so what you're looking at here is some more figures by, from Mike. Uh, mixed layer depth versus delta P CO2. First off, delta P CO2 is really sucked in when mixed layer depths are shallow. That's consistent with turning on large phytoplankton blooms. And you can talk to Mike about this is after we've done all the temperature corrections for CO2. The size of the circle indicates the size of the bloom and the color indicates the proportion of either cryptophytes or diatoms. So reds are diatoms. So you can have big cryptophyte blooms, but even when you have a big cryptophyte bloom, they tend to suck in um, less uh, CO2. Yeah, and so, um, is there a biological reason for that? Well, actually there is. These flagellates are mixotrophic. They eat, they respire, and they photosynthesize. They truly are awesome and are completely unstudied. Um, and so there's a biogeochemical impact of shifting the community just based on either size distribution or biology that is significant. But the thing that it really impacts is the stuff that likes to eat the phytoplankton. So if you look at it relative to scale, this is what a cryptophyte looks like to a krill. This is what a diatom looks like to a krill. And if you do jarred experiments and look at grazing efficiencies, uh, phytoplankton size makes a big difference of how well the krill feed. If cells get too small, they can't eat them very well. The reason krill have these feathered arms, they grab water, they shove it in their mouth, and um, the small cells go through those feathered arms. Um, and so there's a physical sort of limit. So 
There's an impact for the krill because when you have these guys, there's also less chlorophyll. So you've decreased the amount of food, but you've shifted the food resource in a way that's unfavorable for them to harvest it um, and has a potential impact uh, on their populations. Uh, how tightly coupled are the dynamics of the primary uh, producers to essentially the krill? Um, this is a paper that Grace Saba put together, and you're looking again at chlorophyll anomaly Palmer. Black is chlorophyll anomaly. The stippled line is bacteria productivity. Um, we like to argue on the ship. The bacterial people say that the bacteria drive the phytoplankton. That is completely ridiculous and shall not be uttered in this house as long as I'm the chair. Um, but the cool thing is, is comparing it to what the penguins are eating. So these are stomach uh, samples from krill um, that have been collected from puked uh, penguin diets. Essentially, you grab the penguin, you pour a little seawater down its throat, they get sick, they puke it up, and you sort the puke. And you do it for decades and decades. Um, and so when you have a high proportion, the maroon colors, your population up here is dominated by big adult krill. Down here, um, you're dominated by essentially larval krill. And what you see is, okay, we have a chlorophyll anomaly here. It was a happy year. The population was dominated by adults. And the next year, it's reset dominated by larvae. What happened? Um, well, you know, mom and dad went out. They had a really amazing dinner, a few bottles of wine. Magic happened, and you've reset the whole population to larval krill. Over time, when there's low chlorophyll anomalies, the population ages. Chlorophyll anomaly, reset. You know, and so we see that year after year after year. Um, I was just out in Montana a month ago with Bill Frazier, who's collected this, and we're up through the present, and you see this repeated the entire time. So it's a very linear food web from the phytoplankton up to the krill um, with a one-year lag. That data was at Palmer Station because we were sampling essentially what the penguins were eating. Um, do we see it in the population dynamics over the shelf as a whole? This is work from Debbie Steinberg. And we can see these cyclical patterns, um, just like we do in the chlorophyll anomalies, rippling through. The one thing we tend to do is we tend to talk about krill. It's really one type of krill we're talking about in terms of food webs, Euphausia superba. And this is to point out there's many other different types of krill um, that are important for um, the food web but not in terms of some of the higher trophic levels that require a lot of biomass to be fed. So like ice krill seems to be doing really well, um, which is an interesting question in the South. So that's a dynamic we don't understand. But we can see these repeated uh, climate-driven signals in the krill. So we feel pretty good about that. So now let's go to the penguins. So this is Bill Frazier tracking it since he got out of Vietnam and then essentially decided to become a penguin biologist and rebuild his soul. Um, and when he started at Palmer Station, there was about 15,000 breeding pairs. And right now we're down to about 800. Um, and the other thing to notice is those last years where we've had an increase in the ice, we've stabilized, but we haven't seen a recovery. And so we're gonna talk about that in a minute. Even if the delis disappear from Palmer Station, it doesn't mean that we're gonna be empty of life. <clears throat> Other species from the north that are subpolar species starting from the Falklands south are moving in. Uh, Gentoo penguins here taking off, chin straps are taking off. Um, and so that's our transition point at the higher trophic levels of new, a new subpolar system dominated by people with specific uh, life strategies that deal better when there's no ice. So why does a penguin live or die as a colony? The key thing is his chick fledging weight. Um, so when they have their babies, lay their egg, they have a few months to essentially put over three kilograms of fat on the chick. If they don't, the chick will not survive winter. And that's a very short period to cram a lot of krill into the chick. And we have a lot of good biological data about Adelie penguins, so we actually sort of know what that critical weight is. Um, so you got this dotted line here. If you're below this line and you're a chick, you're definitely dying. If you're above the blue line, if you're not eaten by a leopard seal or something like that, you'll probably make it through the winter. 
The two things that really affect this chick fledging weight is one, availability of food, based on modeling studies, <coughs> but the other one is thermal regulatory cost. And uh, the thing that affects thermal regulatory cost is essentially um, wind and wetness. So if you look here in the deli, in a dry environment, their down is very well suited um, as they're hanging out exposed to the elements as opposed to when it's very wet. And one thing that's happened, like we mentioned before with the clouds, as the atmosphere's moister, we're getting more snow in the north and at Palmer Station than we did before. And that's melting and turning to water in summertime because um, it's warm enough in summer where you can wear a Hawaiian shirt. Um, and so there's an extra cost for this chick, which translates directly into extra food the parent has to provide. And so if you look at sort of mean fledgling weight, you know, over the last few years, black is sort of the mean, and then we've decomposed it into to what degree it's a good survivorship year or a bad survivorship year. You know, the years we see that the chicks are doing really well, um, based on our models of the thermal regulatory cost is actually a good year for them because essentially they've had plenty of food and the conditions have been such that there haven't been heavy wind. And vice versa, you know, there are years that are tragically bad and essentially you see a decline. So in a heavy ice year, the Adeli chicks, about half of them survive. If you're in a low ice year, only about 30% of them survive. And then interdi interdisposed in this, is the presence of snow. So in the life history of the Adelis, they tend to build their nests in gullies and rookeries because they essentially want to be protected from the wind and the cold temperature that's very brutal. That's a great strategy when it's dry. When it's wet, what happens? Snow melts, it runs down into gullies and forms large puddles. And so in heavy, heavy snow years, we've seen 100% failure because all the eggs drowned in these gullies. The Gentoos, we can't do the same analysis because we don't know enough about the physiology to sort of do this energy budget for the uh, survivorship. But what we do know from their life cycles is they tend to build their nests higher. And so they're actually exposed to more wind. So if it's a brutally cold year, there's going to be a cost. But during these wet summers that we're experiencing more and more, their chicks are actually going to be more protected. And so here's where, yeah, food is an important thing translating up the food web, but their adaptations to extreme weather is actually another thing that's starting to hit specific species at specific times. Also now there's more than one type of penguin species. Another potential idea is do they actually forage in the same locations? And so um, Bill Frazier and company have been putting radio tag penguins or radio tags on penguins um, and essentially looking at where they're foraging. And so you can see uh, Adelis versus Gentoos as these different colors. And there's actually not that much overlap. And so we've sort of poo-pooed that as an idea. And you can actually look at the depth at which they forage. Adelis tend to forage shallower, Gentoos deeper. And so there's a, you know, not necessarily a direct competition for food. But what we see is the way they feed under different ice conditions is different. So if you go to Adelis, and you compare a low ice year to a high ice year. In a high ice year, the Adelis concentrate very close to their nests and feed there. Um, they also interact with the ice differently. They tend to go more underneath ice flows. The Gentoos, not used to as much ice, they decide to walk over the ice flows. And this is not like smooth ice. This is crumpled up marginal sea ice. And they tend to expand the amount of area they have to feed in a heavy ice year. So the Gentoos, in a heavy ice year are wasting a lot of energy going all over trying to get to the open water, climbing over the top, while the Adelis are essentially constricting themselves closer, saving energy and are more efficient interacting with the ice. So, you know, if this were to continue, our prediction would be that the Adelis would regain their foothold simply because they know how to feed an ice. Um, and where they feed tends to be right near the chlorophyll maximum that's driven by the mixed layer depth like I was talking about, which is where you find the krill doing it. And you can see over a season, the purple here is essentially wind speed. As wind speed goes up later in the season, 
you can see the mix layer depth deepen, and you can see those dive depths deepen over time. You know, so while there's some flexibility feeding in the vertical, driven by mix layer depth, um, you know, they, it's more the spatial component that's important. The other thing to mention is you feed deeper, you're burning more energy. So all that feeds into that chick fledging weight. You know, so the more energy you expend, the less fat you put on your chick. There's two other factors. I already mentioned the snow. So here you see a penguin calling a heavy snow year, and then it's when this melts that you have a large mortality event. The other thing is, is you're changing the type of fish that are present there. <clears throat> this is Plurogramma. It's about six inches long. It's a very oily fish built for ice. And if you count the calories in a Plurogramma fish versus a krill, you need to eat three to 400 krill for one fish. And you go back to the 70s, half of the diet from the penguin barf was the plurogramma fish. You know, you needed only a few to essentially fill your needs. But because the ice has disappeared, plurogramma lays eggs in the ice for their larvae, and uh, they're not really breeding there. They're there, but only low. To give you an idea, back in the 70s, based on uh, things, the plurogramma numbers were somewhere up here. And that collapsed in the early 90s. Um, so these life history characteristics modulate sort of the food-driven response driven by the base of the food web. The other thing is, is other competitors. Are new things moving in? Well, um, we're looking at whales. And so here you're looking at a humpback foraging area done by visual inspection and then putting a tag on the whale. If you've never done it, you should, it's so awesome. You go up in a zodiac, you gotta be within this close to essentially try to put a little suction cup on a whale. And there's nothing that makes you feel smaller than being that close with an animal that large. Um, there's some overlap where they feed in the water column. Um, there's a big overlap of the time of year. And the whales are so mobile, they essentially are all around all the foraging areas. And so why would this have changed? Well, the whales were hunted down in this area for hundreds of years. And humans took about two million, over two million of them out of the West Antarctic Peninsula system. They essentially cleared the system of whales. The Antarctic was made into a preserve and those numbers now are dramatically increasing again. So there is a hypothesis that, okay, they were competing for food in the past the whales were taken out of the system, the penguins had a heyday, their major food competitor was gone, and now as the whales come back, the penguins are feeling the decline. Um, and so potentially, you know, we're seeing part of the Adeli problem is now they have a super competitor for food. The problem is it's really hard to collect the data. So the first way you do is you put those tags on um, and you look at where they're foraging. And so this is our best map to date. Um, but we don't have enough yet to definitively essentially talk about seasonal foraging, foraging areas across the peninsula. So we only started this a few years ago. But if you look at it, you know, our prediction would be for the whales, that is, you essentially melt ice, you're going to open up area for humpback whales. Um, and, you know, Essentially, we're finding humpback whales there living at the peninsula longer and longer um, because winter's coming later and later. Um, and the whales that are associated with the ice exclusively appear to be declining. So we think we're starting to see potential trends that might be significant over time at the highest trophic level. And while our next phase of the project is hopefully going to nail to what degree there is any food competition. So that's an open question. All right, to just end up, um, the one thing that is driven home to us is that we're gonna have to apply a bunch of new ways to sample. One, because uh, we need to do it cheaper, just given flat budgets, but also because the questions are changing. So one thing that's always been a bother, especially at Palmer Station, is what's the circulation? And so Josh went down there a few years ago, he installed a CODAR unit for a year, and he'll be back down there next year. So we can actually get an idea of what the circulation is driving essentially a lot of those dynamics and calibrate those models that we can use to fill in the sampling gaps. 
We have land stations all across the peninsula. Um, and there's no reason we need ships to connect them. We can do that with gliders. So this is a mission that Nicole ran last year. Um, there were two gliders. One went from the U.S. station up north, close to where the Argentinians were, but more where NOAA was. Um, another one flew all the way down to Rothra. Um, and you can see that we can essentially cover the space going pretty well. This is temperature, so this is that winter water layer that's unique to the Antarctic in terms of ice formation. Here's particle concentrations on the same thing. And you can see how dynamic it is. Look at these large export events in very specific locations. So a lot of complexity we'd like to get to. Um, the idea is, is with the robots, there's no reason you can't fly down to the British base. The British recharge the battery. They send it home. And you do it every month of the year. Eventually, we'll need to figure out how to fly under ice. Um, but that's a project to come right now. So a sustained presence. New sensors, such as the list, particle size distribution seems to be important for that linear food web at the base. And now we have laser systems that allow us to look at total number of cells as well as their mean size. So we should be able to start determining broad spatial maps rather than using pigments of what the size distribution is. I don't think cryptophytes per se are bad tasting. I just think that uh, large cells are easier to feed on. And so we can start validating that. Um, the thing about the pigment data is right now, um, we only talk at the taxon level. There's big diatoms, there's small diatoms, um, there's lots of different flagellates, and so we're going to have to go to species. Um, I'm really bad on the microscope, and so um, I'd rather spend money. Um, and so we did, and so we have a system that essentially takes a picture of every single cell um, and gives us a size distribution and number. Um, the problem with that, is a lot of data. So Skylar has spent her summer trying to sort out just her few stations, which represent about 2% of the available data. We have about 10 million images to sort. So if you like this work, come see me. Um, we'll be using AI approaches. And then we're talking about getting essentially holographic sensors to go after microzooplankton on gliders. And then we can fly fleets between the stations and fill in the gaps when the ship's not there. Grace has sort of gotten us finally into multi-frequency acoustics. So here's a glider holding its big acoustic bay. Essentially, is going to allow us to sort out um, zooplankton from fish and start making sustained measurements of that. We can't really answer, is there food competition, if we really don't have a good estimate of how much food is there, right? You know, because that way, um, we can essentially determine who's winning, who's losing. But now we have an approach to go forward on that. Drones are coming in. The old way we would do census is drop one or two humans off at an island, leave them there for five days living in a tent while we cruised around on the ship, um, and they would try to count everything. Um, the drones now can essentially map what we would do in five days in about 45 minutes. Um, it's about two centimeter resolution. And uh, you can see the orange here. That's penguin guano. Those are actually nesting colonies. Um, this is a thermal image. You can't really see it here. Some of the dots are brighter. Those are uh, baby penguins. Their down releases more heat than the adults. So you can separate out adults from babies. Um, and um, you can essentially get very clear maps of all the major uh, rookery distributions. You can also do behavioral ecology. Here's a bubble feeding net by two uh, humpbacks. You can see one coming up from below another one in the middle, um, and essentially look at the dynamics. The way we would do this before is you'd be out there in a zodiac, and the last place you want to be in a zodiac is right when they come up to the surface, because that means they're coming up underneath you. Um, and so now we can do it safely, but we can do it in a sustained way to get a better idea of those life history traits. The other way is actually to put equipment on the animals. So this is a, essentially a camera and accelerometer put on a humpback. You're going to see it turn around, go to the surface, um, and you'll see it open its mouth, and you'll see all the krill that it misses that pours out. Um, so you can actually see the krill swarm there as it's coming up near the surface. And now watch it open up and go for it. There's its gullet right there. So it's sucking all those krill up, and you can see the ones getting away. The cool thing is the accelerometer also gives you pitch and roll and acceleration. 
And these are lunge feeders. And so you can actually count how many times they're lunging. The reason that's really important from the ecology side is a lot of the real smart higher trophic levels will modulate when they're going to feed an area or when they're going to leave. Because if it's too much lunging, they're not getting enough energy per unit dive. And then they'll move elsewhere. And so for the food resource question, um, we're hoping this is actually going to give us a lot better snapshot of that. So I think I've shown that climate cycles are modulating the WAP. The big question will be to what degree that's going to be accelerated as we move forward and we'll start seeing the man-made signature definitively. I think we're seeing it, but I can't say it scientifically. Um, and that it's really the drivers of sea ice that's essentially changing the biochemistry as well as the food web by modulating how much the phytoplankton grow. And what we're seeing is that the mixed layer depths in that part of the world have shallowed dramatically and that's consistent with the trends in sea ice. Um, there's a pretty direct connection that if you get a lot of plant material that's big into the food web, it translates directly into krill recruitment affecting all the higher trophic levels. Um, and so if you model the food web um, using sort of abrupt analysis techniques, it's a very linear system. There's not much hysteresis. The hysteresis shows up in the higher trophic levels where a lot of those life cycle um, history traits show up. Um, and that we have new tools to expand this time series going forward. They're going to allow us to look at the dynamics that traditional fixed ship sampling won't let us do. So. I wanted to stop five minutes early so we would have time for questions. And if not, grad students can go study for their midterms. So thank you very much. So. Malin. Yep, and, and uh, less uh, shelf stratification because of the melt seawater in spring. Yeah, so you essentially cap the ocean with more ice, with more ice through the winter season. In a high ice here, yeah, and right now we have less ice, especially up north. Most of the data I showed you from the ship was south of Palmer Station. So it was still in the polar region where we're still in transition. You know, so up north where those satellite maps showed large chlorophyll declines, that's where we're now almost always in a low ice condition. Palmer Station and south is more modular year to year. It's still in transition. So if you go north, like a good example is, is if you go to the Argentinian base and you look at the glacier there, the glaciers are melting so fast. So 20 years ago, you look at pictures of their basin where their boat basin is, and it's blue water. It's very nice oceanic. Now it's, it's muddy brown all year round because of all the land erosion and how much of the glacier is melting all year round. And so there, we're seeing a huge decline of phytoplankton but you're seeing declines of krill, and it's one part there's less food, but the main thing they're finding is a lot of the small krill are choking on small pebbles and stones and particles that are being washed out of these fjords into the coastal ocean. So if, you know, after I pass on um, and the next PI for the LTR comes in, what we'll probably have is the low ice condition spanning most of the peninsula. It took about 30 years, we think, for it to transition into the north. We think we're sort of at the middle of Palmer, and our prediction is in 40 years, what we're seeing at Palmer now will be down at Rothra. Yeah. I'm a little, I'm a little confused by that thing, too, because the, the, the heavy ice here shows the, the more effective to the surface. Essentially, yeah, all, all we're saying, I mean, this is just an arbitrary line drawn for the cartoon, but essentially the amount of wind mixing is significantly less. And the old paradigm for the Antarctic was why is there life in the marginal ice zone? It's because it was a place to set up protection of the ocean from wind. 
because essentially it's a light limited system, at least on the shelf. When you get offshore, iron limitation becomes a bigger deal. Um, but, you know, essentially this low ice condition allows just vigorous mixing through the winter, through the spring, and then you have no stabilization or very little stabilization of fresh water at the surface. You know, we tend to see the same thing in the Amundsen Sea. Um, so in the areas where we see a lot of meltwater runoff stabilizing the water column, that's where we find the big blooms in the Amundsen Sea Polynia. Um, and so that's sort of our working paradigm right now. Yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, yeah, so the, the other thing is, is if you're in a high ice condition, if we sort of talk about multi-year time frame, the high ice condition is a polar, more of a polar system, the atmosphere is drier, and you have fewer clouds, actually. Well, that didn't even like that hypothesis. No light. No light. No light's bad. So... This condition actually has the potential for more light. You know, even if it's further south. You know, simply because if you look at cloud cover um, and you're out on a ship and you can do this anywhere globally and you look at your PAR function over the course of the day, if a cloud passes overhead, it decreases by over 50, 60, 70 percent. And so sometimes in the north now for ocean color, we can only use monthly imagery because we might only have seven clear atmospheric days a, you know, a month. And so um, ultimately I think it, on the offshore side of the shelf, I cede to Rob Shirell that iron is a critical component. But my thinking, especially in the coastal zone where the ecosystem is really cranking, it's a light limited system. And so physical factors that modulate that, that's what ripples through. Kilograms. There's not that. There, there's, there's, there's a, there, like here's where the ice comes in. There's more points now in this halo zone. You know, and this is a model, right? This dotted line here. So it doesn't mean you're necessarily dead. I'd say that this penguin who survived down to the lower end of this is just a tough son of a bitch. It made it through. Um, but it, we do know that if you go below the red line, you literally don't have enough energy to make it through the winter. Yeah. It's, been it's been increasing. This is when that ice came back. So we actually saw that there was some recovery. We don't have data back because these uh, measurements only started more recently. So there is a hint that Adelie's stabilized, and you see it in the, the population. It's, you know, they stopped declining. They essentially became more of a flat response. What we didn't see is a recovery, and there's two possibilities. When they leave as a chick, so the parents feed them, it's kind of like college, they say, okay, good luck, they kick them off the ice, and the chicks go out and they swim around for a few years and then eventually will come back to their breeding zones. So it could be that we're still waiting for the full population to show up from the chicks from the ice years. You know, um, or that these other processes like snow and this and that are an added factor that aren't allowing them to recover, you know. Um, and so that'll be the experiment we'll have to follow over the next few years. We should be getting just to the point where when the ice really came back, that the chicks should be returning in the next year or two. You know, so we'll have to wait and see. Rob. Yep. Focus on it because Palmer State is there. But the low iron 
Yeah, well, I mean. Completely south of there, below, yeah. really close to the coastal zone. Actually. Yeah. So, but hold on. So, Point one, yeah. So, but Palmerdine always seems to be a high iron era. And we published this paper yep. this year suggesting why that might be the yeah. case and suggesting that the iron is mm-hmm. from shallow sediments that surround like yeah. 170 degrees around that endangerment. But uh, you were presenting earlier on, you were talking about Palmer Deep as being a penguin feeding area because of history, basically. Yeah, that well, essentially what I think it was. Well, I, the real thing we need to actually start studying is what's happening in winter. Yeah. Winter. yeah. Because the Polini idea is really based on what food they have in winter. And so in the 27 years of this program, there's been one winter cruise. Yeah. And so we don't really have a good idea what's happening there.